tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 18. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Tonight's story, a nightmare noir thriller and cautionary tale for those who would dare to dream, comes from an exciting and accomplished Horror Hill newcomer by the name of Jacopo della Quercia, and it's a really good one, so don't you go running off now. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Jacopo della Quercia, I give you... Sleep Dead. Whoever said that sleep is for the weak can go to hell. Sleep sharpens a person. It toughens you. After one night in this pit, my mind's a diamond. It started off like any other work night. I was in my office doing night work. When my clock struck one, I checked my wristwatch, a Daniel Lowe. It told me it was 2.03 a.m., Amused, I turned my head to the framed engraving of Nebuchadnezzar hanging by my liquor. Before I know it, I'm standing there with an empty glass, admiring the Doré woodcut as I grab a bottle. I refill my ice and whiskey as lightning flashes outside my windows. It's raining buckets. I count five fingers on my left hand. The last time I checked, I counted eight. A roll of thunder gently rocks the office. I lift my tumbler to my lips and count the ice cubes bobbing in it. I count them again, but then I hesitate. Something's not right, I realize. I hold the crystal to my eyes and inspect its details against the lamplight. Every groove and speck of gold appears precisely where they should be. Even my fingerprints are visible, and they never are. Not in this place. I stand transfixed in disbelief. How is this real? I know it isn't. That's when I remember the old engraving encased in glass in front of me. I lean close to the framed doré and search for my reflection on its shiny surface. To my relief, I search in vain. All I see is Nebuchadnezzar roasting his victims. My heartbeat slows. I reclaim my wits. I remind myself... It's just a dream. I clench my tumbler into a fist and punch the ancient king with all my strength, forcing glass and jagged crystal fragments deep into my skin. Beads of blood roll down the picture as whiskey licks my wounds like burning tongues. It hurts like the dickens, but I'm used to it. Every now and then I need to pinch myself to know I'm dreaming. After wrestling with the pain, I pull my hand back from the portrait. The engraving is undamaged, and my uninjured fingers are cradling an empty glass. I check my watch. It's half past thirteen, an hour which I know does not exist. Satisfied, I refill the tumbler and enjoy my drink, thinking life's a dream. And that's the way she found me. More specifically, 
That's when she chose to make her presence felt. Detective King. I glance at the King of Spades painted against my office door. The shapely silhouette of a woman stands behind its smoky glass. The door's unlocked, I tell her. In my mind, it always is. When solving cases in your sleep, I find it's best not to keep too many memories locked away. You can come in. The doorknob turns with a crack of thunder and seems to open on its own. I swear her hands never leave her side. Knowing what I do now, I don't think all the locks in Alcatraz would have kept her from me. She casts the shadow of an hourglass as she walks into my office. She is tall for a dame, a blonde, and dressed from hat to heels in black. Her lips are full, her skin like marble, and her thick hair styled in a classic fashion. Late 19th century, she looks dressed to kill in ways you'd never know unless she found you, or unless you found yourself, as I did, on the receiving end of her piercing stare. Her eyes, those steel-blue eyes as deep as the ocean, as hard as ice. One look from them could have sent a chill down a dead man's spine, or at the very least raise his eyebrows. Good evening, ma'am. I shut the door behind us and inherit her coat and hat. No jewelry, I notice. Nor makeup. You on your way to a funeral, or did you just come from one? She answers. Neither. I pause and tilt my head at her, unsure if she's acting wise or if I need to wise up. In either case, well, that makes two of us. Please, have a seat. Her coat and hat have a familiar look and heft to them when I hang them. To my confusion, they're both bone dry, even though it's pouring rain, and she didn't arrive with an umbrella. I remind myself that this black skirt is just a passing shadow in my mind. She's in my dream, my brain, my temple. She is Athena, and I'm her Zeus. Would you like a splash of poison? I ask as I pour myself more whiskey. Poison doesn't work on me. I smirk. Sounds like you're speaking from experience. As expected, she does not respond, but not for the reason I intended. I look over my shoulder to see her seated with her back to me. I don't know if she's watching the rain outside my windows, or... Realizing my error, I collect the folders strewn on my desk and return them to my file cabinet. Two go into the top drawer, and one goes in the middle. Looking down, I give my bottom drawer a gentle kick. It remains as locked as Fort Knox. I return to my desk, adding, I'm sorry about the mess. As I sit down, to my surprise, the woman isn't looking out my windows, but at them. Specifically, at the one behind my head. I swivel around and read my name painted on it, along with the same playing card as on my door. Got something on your mind, missy? Yes. If you don't mind me asking. I can't say I'll mind until I hear it, so ask away. Just keep the question short and complimentary. She returns my smile with a false one. Why did you settle on the King of Spades? For the agency? She nods. I understand the King, Detective King. But why did you choose the King of Spades? Well, because Spade and Archer were a pair of jokers. I offer the gal a cigarette, which she declines. Those things are deadly. Huh, I agree. I don't like jokers. I like myself a lucky strike. What about the King of Diamonds? Ugh, I'm a detective, darling, not a jeweler. The King of Clubs. I shake my head. That symbol looks too much like a pawnbroker's from the sidewalk. Why not the King of Hearts? My god, I think. Lady, did you come here with a job or to play pinochle? That's not an answer to my question, she replies with moxie. I freeze in place, wondering what corner of my subconscious this gal crawled out of. I asked you why you did not wish to be identified by the King of Hearts. Does the card not suit you well, detective? Two long, angry plumes of smoke shoot from my nostrils. 
The woman's got more backbone than a brontosaurus. Outside, I'm furious. Deep down, I'm terrified. At that moment, a gentle knock begins to rap against my eardrums. It's coming from somewhere inside the office. Thunder, I tell myself. It's only thunder. This time, a second, louder knocking jostles the bottom drawer of my file cabinet. My eyes shift to and from the files. Outside, the storm intensifies. Lightning flashes against my windows, projecting my name against the walls. But not the King of Spades beneath it. No. All I see is the King of Hearts. I shut my eyes and I down my whiskey. As the liquor goes to work, the pounding and flashing stops. I take a breath and regain my marbles. I'm sorry, lovely, but my time is limited. How limited? Increasingly. I close the window blinds behind me, obscuring the name and playing card the dame just played me with. So, if you don't mind me asking, dollface, who are you? And why are you here? The dame in black leans toward me, bathing her face in the shadow of my window blinds. I'm looking for information on an old case you worked. Which one? The Bauerdorf murder. I take a deep drag from my cigarette as I look the gal down and up. You a family member? Her pink lips purse, concealing her amusement. Not exactly. You a college friend, a former roommate? Lover? I ask. All three? I had hoped to arouse some anger with my line of questioning. In my experience, it knocks people off their game and spills their beans, be it in a game of poker or in the dream world. I'm waiting for those dark blue diamonds in her eyes to flash like daggers. Instead, the dame just sits with her eyes downcast, unaffected, like she was waiting for a bus to hit me. I narrow my eyelids into snake slits. There's something familiar about this damsel and whatever it is, she's hiding it from me. My mind is boiling. Well, I hate to break it to you, dollface, but your time would be better spent searching in a library. I never took that case. I was West Hollywood, and the LAPD doesn't work that beat. The case never came to you? I shake my head and stab my cigarette into an ashtray. You got me wrong. As I said, the LAPD works L.A., the West Hollywood Bulls patrol West Hollywood. I was with the LAPD during the... The dame locks eyes with me, catching me off guard. God damn, she's good, I think. <clears throat> Where was I? The LAPD? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I clear my throat. West Hollywood was outside our jurisdiction. Therefore, the Bauerdorf murder never came to me. Not even accidentally. Her steely eyes probe mine like ice picks, sending a deep chill down my neck. I lower my head to hide my face, incensed over how well she's using my own mind games against me. What you're looking for is in a book somewhere. This book? I snap my head to see the vixen standing alongside my file cabinet. Its top drawer is open and she's reading a small hardcover in the lamplight. Get away from there! I leap from my desk straight to the cabinet and slam it shut. Unfortunately, this causes the middle drawer to pop open, revealing several pages covered with redactions. As I wrestle to control the cabinet, I wedge my foot against the floor to prevent any chance of the bottom drawer busting open. What is this? The lady asks, her eyes burrowed in the book. That's nothing! I reach for the text, but she keeps it from me. That book's top drawer stuff, old memories, it's nothing dangerous. Then why is there blood on it? I hear dripping, and it isn't rain. She hands the book back to me and my mind's eye zooms in on the dark memento. I see the book laid atop a desktop, just as I found it at Los Angeles Public Library. It's October 1944. I'm wearing my old LAPD uniform, and I'm interviewing two librarians about the grim discovery they made that morning. I saw it, officer. There was blood on its pages, I swear. Did you see who returned it, ma'am? No. 
It must have been here all evening. But the last person who checked it out was... Ma'am, I... I'm sorry, officer. It's just... It's just... The book had been checked out by the woman murdered in Hollywood last week, officer. Thank you, ma'am. Detective King? I look away from the blood-stained book and the dame in black. With my mind made up, I wander back to Nebuchadnezzar and pour myself more liquid courage. Eight years ago, some crackpot returned a book to the public library smeared with blood. The book was on loan to Georgette Bauerdorf, deceased. So, I collected it as evidence and delivered it to the detectives at West Hollywood. Did you read the book? Mm, only the parts with blood on them. This section? The dame in black hands me a wad of typed up pages. As I reach for them, our fingers touch. Her skin's as smooth as melting ice. I remove a paperclip from the pages and accidentally slice my finger. The cut hurts so much. The pain is blinding. I drop the pages and my mind flashes with the white of wood pulp. I see myself, still in uniform, typing at LAPD Central Station. As my fingers tap dance atop my Remington, I turn my head to and from the bloodstained pages on my desk. A Study of Dreams by Friedrich von Eden. Letter by letter, I preserve the memory. Since 1896, I have studied my own dreams, writing down the most interesting in my diary. In 1898, I began to keep a separate account for a particular kind of dream, which seemed to me the most important, and I have continued it up to this day. Altogether, I collected about 500 dreams, of which 352 were the particular kind just mentioned. This material may form the basis of what I hope may become a scientific structure of some value. I pause to read the essay, but I'm no longer at the headquarters. I'm in my apartment on that same evening, about to attempt what Friedrich von Eden dubbed lucid dreaming. In these lucid dreams, the reintegration of the psychic functions is so complete that the sleeper remembers day life and his own condition reaches a state of perfect awareness and is able to direct his attention and to attempt different acts of free volition. Perfect awareness. There's no better way to describe it. I remember it as clear as crystal. I remember my first lucid dream. I see myself staring at my hands in disbelief, realizing the godlike powers that are my fingertips. I see myself performing fantastic feats, flying, surviving gunshots, and even conversing with fallen friends. And then I take the big jump. I see myself exploring the deepest depths of my mind and memory. In a single plunge, I see my subconscious. I relive it all, my entire memory, the entire world, my entire life. I also witnessed the crime that got me here. Through my mind's eye, I see the Bowerdorf murder as it played out. I reconstruct the evening precisely as my subconscious knows it. It's October 12th, 1944, just after midnight. Georgette Bowerdorf, brunette, age 20, returns to her apartment after a busy night at the Hollywood canteen. A man is waiting for her. One of many draftees she's met there. He's one of the hundreds of men she works with, dances with, and occasionally sleeps with. He's been there before. He knows the location. He unscrews the light bulb outside her door, leaving a fingerprint. He's also a patient predator. He stalks. He lingers. And as he waits, he reads a book Georgette has open. Some bedside reading on lucid dreaming. I read the last words printed on the page before Georgette's blood stains them. We are here, however, on the borders of a realm of mystery where we have to advance very carefully. To deny may be just as dangerous and misleading as to accept. I don't deny the warning. I accept it. I recognize my responsibility as a law enforcer and I search for answers in the realm of mystery. 
I gasped for air. Did you see that? I asked the dame in black beside me. She shakes her head. I don't have much experience at dreaming. Why not? She sighs. I never sleep. My eyes widen. You don't. Why? Too much work, she tells me flatly. Curious what work is like within the dream world, I ask. What do you do? She turns her back on me and changes the subject. I understand that you dream differently. How do you control them? I approach her with a smirk of confidence. You use your head. I snap my fingers in front of her and then present her with the most beautiful rose one can imagine. She accepts it speechlessly. Anyone can lucid dream by spotting telltales that they're asleep. Once you find them, the secret to not waking up is simply not to mind them. I guess my line of work prepared me well for that. When you're a cop, you're always on the lookout for something suspicious. When you're dreaming, something suspicious tends to delve into the fantastic. It could be an extra finger, a change in scenery, a lack of reflection. Anything you know could only happen in a dream. Once you find them, you work with them. Eventually, you learn how to build with them. I guide her gaze to the windows, presenting the entire world of my creation. The woman runs her eyes over the rainy cityscape. This is all you're doing. I smile, every inch of it, including you, my lovely. I hate to break it to you, but only one of us is alive. It's like through the looking glass. You're Alice, and I'm the Red King, fast asleep. You're just a girl in my dream this evening. Fortunately, it's a good dream. I shoot my dream girl a wink. She smiles softly and leans against me as we watch the storm. I put my arm around her and run my fingers through her hair. Briefly, one of my fingers grazes her cheek. I flinch. Her flesh is icy to the touch. The woman sees the surprise on my face and pushes herself away from me before I can apologize. Tell me more about the murder, she says, her back to me. Irritated with myself over my error, I lean against my file cabinet. I'm sorry, but I can't. There's only so much I can tell you without this place going haywire. It could get messy. You said you could control this world. I can, but I can also lose control of it. Even I have nightmares sometimes, and when you're a lucid dreamer, experiencing a lucid nightmare could do a number on you. I could go crazy. You won't, she insists. The dame folds her arms and straightens her posture. I'll be here. I choke on my own throat, unable to contain my laughter. <laughs> Sweetheart. Oh, it doesn't work that way. The woman's diamond eyes begin to water. To my shock, a single teardrop drips down her face. You won't protect me? Hey. I dab her tears with a handkerchief. There's no reason for that, doll face. It's not that I don't like you or don't trust you. I just don't want you to see the worst this place has to offer. What are you afraid of? I exhale, exhausted from avoiding the obvious. Here, I say. I loop my arm around my ladies and lead her to my file cabinet. As I said, you can build entire worlds in here. The Romans called them memory palaces, but I like to keep things simple. I like the office I'm asleep in. The only difference is this number. I wrap my knuckles against the file cabinet. All my memories are in here. Unfortunately, memories tend to come in three flavors. Good, bad, and nightmarish. I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of. While those are memories I'm prepared to live with, I don't want them setting up shop in here. It's too dangerous, too traumatizing. This file cabinet is the only thing keeping the worst from taking over. It's where I cage my demons. The dame looks up at me, worry in her eyes. Detective King, she gasps still clutching my handkerchief. What have you done? I lead her back to my armchair so that I can break it to her gently. Once she's seated, 
I light myself another cigarette and lean against my desk. When I delivered that book to West Hollywood, the sheriff's department couldn't make heads or tails of it. They were dumb as donuts. All they knew was that Miss Bowerdorf spent most of her nights with men in uniform. Georgette was just a child. She was only 20 years old, an angel. And she was brutally raped and murdered by someone who most likely was enlisted. We were in the middle of a war. I didn't want to see her killer get off easy. Not with dimwits like D.A. Hauser granting leniency to soldiers right and left. I had to do something. Why you? Who gave you that right? That stung me. The American people gave me that right. I took an oath, princess. It was my duty. I swore to defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Because of some harebrained law involving maps, Miss Bowerdorf's killer stood no chance of facing justice. The LAPD should have been allowed to take that case. We would have found that angel's killer, and we would have sent him straight to hell. The system failed to protect Miss Bowerdorf. So, I had to act alone in the name of justice. The dame begins to crush my handkerchief into a fist. And what, if I may ask, is your idea of justice? At this point, my ashtray is up to its ass and butts. I collected all the evidence I could find on the Bauerdorf murder. I spent night after night examining them at that desk, and unlike the detectives at West Hollywood, I found the man who murdered Georgette Bauerdorf. He was a draftee, en route to San Francisco for deployment in the Pacific. I got him dead to rights by comparing fingerprints found at the scene with records the Navy had on file. He covered his tracks, both at the scene and when he returned that library book. It was all a ruse, to dupe the dullards of West Hollywood into thinking the Bowerdorf killer was still in the city. And it worked in spades. He had probably killed before, and I have no doubt that he would have killed again. That's why I gave him a choice, once I confronted him in San Francisco. If he didn't kill himself right then, and there, I do it myself, and I didn't plan to make it quick and painless. A dark shadow spreads across the damsel's face. You were an officer of the law, and you convinced this man to kill himself. I nod. That's right. And I'd do it again if I had to. You did do it again, she said, seething and many more times after that. My eyes widen. Jesus Christ, lady. How much about me do you know already? She snaps her head in anger toward my file cabinet's bottom drawer. Horrified, I rush over to make sure its lock is still intact. Relieved, I turn my head back to the dame. My hair's a mess, and my heart is pounding. How much did you see in there? She rises. I can assure you that I have never opened that drawer. Don't lie to me, Cupcake. You've been stringing me along this entire evening. I know you're hiding something from me, but for now, I want some answers. Did you see the contents of this drawer? Tell me the truth! The woman doesn't raise her volume or resort to threats. She just stares straight at me and says, without a flinch, I never lie. I swallow. Convinced, I pour myself another drink and lay down on my sofa. <laughs> a night like this, I muse while staring at the ceiling. I sometimes think my mind is on a downward spiral. The dame in black sits next to me, her chair beside my head. What do you see that spiral leading to? My eyes stare aimlessly at the ceiling fan as I say suicide. A long, unbroken silence is shared between us. It's just... so... exhausting. I continue, trying to keep all those demons buried. How many are there? 
I clench my jaw as I say the number. Twenty-one. You killed twenty-one men. I closed twenty-one unsolved cases. The Black Dahlia, Bugsy Siegel. I found every one of their killers. Each one of them escaped the system, but I caught them. Did you kill them all? This ruffles my feathers. Not all of them, just the ones who weren't open to my persuasion. Did you always give them the choice of death or suicide? I nod from my sofa pillow. I convinced them to kill themselves so that the boys in the clubhouse would quickly close their investigation. It was my best defense. Did any officers know what you were doing? No, but... But what? I turned my head and looked at the dream girl next to me. By God, she's beautiful. When you... Check that drawer for me. She looks off and back. They're fine. I put another cigarette in my mouth and the dame lights it for me. Thanks, sweetheart. Continue. I puff away. Once I made detective one too many criminals I arrested committed suicide immediately before their trial. I knew they would have gotten off for lack of evidence. I had no choice. It was the only way to keep them off the streets. I was never indicted for what I'd done, but with internal affairs swimming around like sharks, I had to get out of there. I took my tin and heater and off I went to the private sector. They had a nickname for you during this time, didn't they? I nod in sad acceptance. Yeah. Suicide King. The King of Hearts, she says. You have quite a talent for suicide, don't you? I wouldn't call it a talent. What is it then? Experience? Uh, I... Lightning flashes, blinding me as my ears fill with the sound of glass shattering. I see a small house with a broken window, a young boy crying, and a mother trying to console him. It's not your fault, she says, but the kid won't have it. Why did he die? These things happen, my love. No! We killed him! No, we didn't. That poor bird killed itself. Why? Because... Because God told him to. In a rapid montage of flashes, I see a dead bird on the ground, the dame pulling a bloodied window pane from my file cabinet, and a Rorschach inkblot framed on the wall in front of me. No matter how many times I stare at this, it always looks to me like a bird flying into glass. It was my first glimpse of death. Of suicide. I could never shake the image from my head. The dame in black stands beside me, hanging off my arm. Do you want to tell me about your mother? I shake my head. Huh. That'd be opening a Pandora's box. There must be something you can tell me. I close my eyes and turn away from the Rorschach. She died a few years ago in a nursing home. I never visited her. I pause. I should have. The sound of rain fills in the silence and the dame leans her head against my shoulder. Can I ask you one last question? I look down at her and smile softly. <laughs> For you, doll? Anything. The woman moves closer to me. If your mother were still alive, do you think she would forgive you? Mm. No. I don't think so. Why? Why would she? I stuck her in a dead-end nursing home to die alone. The dame goes silent. I don't know if she's thinking or if she's waiting. Finally, she says, If she loved you, she might forgive you. Grateful, I take my dream girl by her hand. To my surprise, it's warm. I throw my arms around her and hold her tightly. 
I don't know who she is or where she came from, but something about her is irreplaceable. She's my dream girl, and I don't want to break our hearts by waking up. I pet her hair and ask, What's your name? The raindrops on my windows roll down her face like tears. Her eyes are downcast. You wouldn't like it. Please, doll. I want to hear it. She looks at me and I at her. My lady in black closes her ice blue eyes and parts her lips. The entire world around us holds its breath. I want to kiss her, but before I do... What's your name? I beg her. Tell me. With cold breath and quiet lips, she whispers, Death. My subconscious realizes before I do. The office shakes as if a bomb exploded. I throw the girl away from me and back away in horror. My god. I am so sorry. A flash of lightning reveals her visage. Beneath her hair and beauty, I see the hooded, skinless, lifeless skull of death. What the hell are you doing here? I gasp. I had no choice, she sobs. You made me do this. I did? Tears come pouring down her face. How could you? A boom of thunder rocks the building. The lights go out and my lady vanishes. Horrified, I take out my lighter and flick it on. As I creep through the darkened office, I hear a pounding at my door. I turn around with my gun primed and pointed. Who's there? I holler. I walk up to the door and crack it open. After peeking out, I see a hideous image from my past. Face to face. It's a familiar face. A bloodied face. The face of Georgette Bauerdorf's killer after I watched him hang himself. I slam my door and lock it as the killer throws himself against its window. As I unload my pistol through its smoky glass, blood splatters the King of Hearts painted on it. I back away from the door and topple a bookcase as a barricade. To my disgust, each of its shelves contains copies of the same blood-covered book. I jump backward, bumping into the coat and hat the dame in black had brought in earlier. They're still hanging from my coat rack, but for some reason the garments now have tags from a pawnbroker. I try to wish away the calamity around me. I try to control my dream. I throw my arms out and cry, ENOUGH! It doesn't work. All my years of lucid dreaming fail to save me. I feel paralyzed and powerless. And worst of all, no matter how hard I try, I can't escape. I can't wake up. Lightning flashes and I see a face in front of me. I fire my gun and hear glass shattering. I inspect the damage and then stagger backward. The figure was my reflection in my framed engraving of Nebuchadnezzar. I spin around at a tizzy, firing my pistol in every direction. I know you're here! I shout, panicking. Show yourself! I want you out of my head! A light clicks on in front of me. It's the lamp atop my file cabinet. I walk toward it with my gun still smoking. My eyes widen with shock. The padlock on my bottom drawer has been shot off. Realizing the nightmare I unleashed, I snap my head back toward my door. A wave of twenty suicides breaks against it. Their faces and blood-stained figures press against my window, desperate to butt and claw their way inside. I leap over my desk and tear down my blinds, prepared to jump through my window. As expected, the King of Hearts covers the glass in front of me. I fire my gun straight at the image, but the window doesn't shatter. Instead, water pours in through the holes I made. Baffled, I peer out the window at the city, and the sight leaves me speechless. 
As far as I can see, the entire city of Los Angeles, my office included, is underwater. I back away from the windows and bump into the dame in black. What's going on? I stammer. Who's doing this? You are, she says without a flinch. This is the world you created your entire life. How the hell am I responsible for this? I demand at gunpoint. Before she answers, a deep, metallic rumble courses through my office. I look outside and see something that even I would not have dreamed. My god. I gasp. A warship the size of the Chrysler building plunges beneath the waves atop the city. The ship comes crashing down just outside my office, shaking everything. Water comes pouring in through my fractured windows. I'm scared to death, but not as frightened as the sailors I see outside. The doomed men pound their palms against my windows in a desperate attempt to get inside. I back away and shake my head at them, knowing that they are doomed. That's when I start seeing shark fins. One of the sailors, just a teenager, erupts with blood as a tiger shark attacks him from behind. Another shark descends on him, disemboweling him. I watch in horror as the poor young lad is ripped in two. The attack turns into a feeding frenzy as hundreds of sailors are torn apart before my eyes. The man you murdered in San Francisco, the woman in black says to me, was a sailor on a warship called the USS Indianapolis. The ship was sunk by the Japanese four months later, taking 300 lives with it, while condemning another 900 to the open sea for days. Only 317 men survived after watching hundreds of their comrades starve or drown. Others chose suicide, Detective King. The rest were attacked by sharks and eaten alive. Some of them were just boys, Detective. And such was the death you sent them to. That was your handiwork, I barked to her. Not mine. I am not like you. I am not death. No, but you pretend you are. It is not your place to whisper suicide into an unsuspecting ear. That is my role, Detective King. My responsibility. My curse. Yeah? Just as it was your job to kill George at Bauerdorf? I sneer. No, she says with angry eyes. She was taken before her time, as was her killer. I shake my head at her. I will not apologize to you for the lives I took. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to them. The woman outstretches her arms and points to the sea of blood outside my window. If you had taken Georgette Bauerdorf's killer to justice, none of these young men would have died in vain. The Indianapolis would have stayed ashore while its crew and officers testified at the killer's trial. The ship would have never met its awful fate. You cost all these men their future, their hopes, their lives. Look upon your work, King of Suicide, and despair. Speechlessly, I take it in. Nearly a thousand men dead in the water, all floating food to manic sharks. It is a crimson masterpiece of death. And I am its composer. For a moment, I feel what it is like to be the figure standing next to me. For a single, chilling instant. I am death. Finally, it is too much. 
I hang my head and turn away, prepare to face the demon sent to claim me. If there's any more suffering I must atone for, please make it quick. The woman turns her head and guides my eyes to my file cabinet. Its bottom drawer is ajar. Obediently, mindlessly, and all but hopelessly, I open it. Within the bottom drawer are my deepest shames and fears, my worst memories and atrocities, the most disgraceful excuses from my existence. I look into the cabinet and find a blood-stained folder. As I pick it up, a single faded photograph slides out of it. It falls face down onto the floor and I bend down to pick it up. I take one look at the picture and then collapse onto my knees. The photograph was one of many I inherited from my late mother. It is old, a relic from the late 19th century, just like the hairstyle of the woman in it. My mother, as a young lady. I drop the picture. The woman in black behind me is wearing my mother's face. White hot tears pour down my cheeks. Why did you do this? I ask. Why her? Why my mother? Because she was the last life you claimed, Detective King. She did not die from age or illness. She killed herself the day she realized that you, her son, had cast her there to disappear. She died alone and forgotten. You condemned her to her fate. With those words, I bury my face into my hands. As I sob, my wall clock chimes. My windows shatter. My whole office begins to flood. If I do nothing, I will drown. If I dive through my windows, the sharks will kill me. If I go out my door, I will have to fight my way through the fists and teeth of every criminal I condemn to suicide. My pupils focus. Determined to defy the world, I push myself up from the ground and point my pistol at the woman. I feel the killer instinct in me fighting for survival. But for all my strength and desperation, I cannot pull the trigger. After all I've sinned, I cannot bring myself to murder my own mother. Behind the woman, the suicides outside my door attack my barrier. Chunks of bloodied flesh float throughout my flooded office. As I run my eyes over the nightmare, I ask the shade. Is this all a dream? The woman shakes her head in uncertainty. As I said, I don't have much experience at dreaming. Frustrated, I bite my lips so hard it's bleeding. At that moment, the Rorschach framed on my wall shatters. A dead bird comes crashing through the frame and lands at my feet with a wet thud. I stare at the bird, its broken body twisted in grotesque angles, just as I remembered it. In my experience, I tell the dame, there's always one surefire way to check out of this hotel. My eyes fall to my pistol, as do hers. Are you sure you want to do this? Unsure, I check my wristwatch. The goddamn dial's broken. No, but... You forced my hand. I stand tall and face the lady with my pistol held to my temple. My finger twitches, about to pull the trigger. My dream girl shakes her head. Don't do it, she begs. Please... If you love me, don't. 
kill yourself? I'm sorry, sweetheart. It's been a dream come true to share this evening with you, but we're at the end of our road. It's time for me to shuffle off. See what else is out there. I take a final breath and cross myself. Farewell, lovely. With death's work done, she accepts my resignation with a kiss. Rest in peace, she whispers. I pull the trigger. My debt is paid. You've been listening to Sleep Debt by Ocopo de la Quercia. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Jacopo de la Quercia is an award-winning educator, essayist, and novelist. His work has been featured on BBC America, Business Insider, CNN Muddy, Folger Magazine, The Huffington Post, Politico Magazine, Reader's Digest, Ripley's Believe It or Not, Slate, and Princeton University's Electronic Bulletin of the Dante Society of America, among others. As a writer, Jacopo strives to present scholarly research in a manner more easily accessible and enjoyable for all audiences, a practice he has honed in the classroom throughout his career. In print, Jacopo can be found in the New York Times bestseller, You Might Be a Zombie and Other Bad News, its follow-up, The D Textbook, the Detective Noir Collection Hard-Boiled Horror, and academic texts, such as the number one Amazon bestseller, Game of Thrones vs. History. His novels, The Great Abraham Lincoln Pocket Watch Conspiracy and License to Quill, are products of years of research and a love for history. He hopes you enjoy them both. As an educator, Jacopo has taught classes on various aspects of history, literature, and the arts since 2006. He has lectured on Machiavellian political psychology at NYU, on William Shakespeare at the Mark Twain House and Museum, on Abraham Lincoln at the New York State Museum, and on narrative medicine at Albany Medical College. He is currently leading several reading and discussion programs in and around the Capital Region as a scholar for Humanities New York. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. (laughs) The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. (laughs) Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. 
visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.